Why is this forest shaped like a fingerprint? That question had been on my mind ever since I stumbled across a Reddit post by a user named Tarek19 two years ago. The caption read, strange DNA-like forests spanning some 30 kilometers in Uruguay, negative 32.519146, negative 55.849753, and I was hooked. Typing the coordinates into Google Maps, I discovered an astonishing sight, an array of forests shaped like a giant fingerprint, perfectly etched into the landscape. As I zoomed in, more questions bubbled up. What exactly am I looking at? What were these forests made of? And why the pattern? My curiosity sent me diving into research, where I came across reports from the World Rainforest Movement. The truth was more complex than I had imagined. Uruguay, a country covering 17 million hectares, hosts nearly 1.3 million hectares of industrial tree plantations. These aren't natural forests, but artificial tree farms made up primarily of two species, pine and eucalyptus. Initially, I assumed these trees might be used for essential oil oils or fragrances, but the reality was more industrial. You see, pine and eucalyptus trees are ideal for producing pulp, the raw, fibrous material essential for manufacturing paper, cardboard, and other products like tissue. Pulp production relies on separating cellulose fibers from wood, creating the basis for strong, smooth paper. Combining pine's long fibers with eucalyptus's short ones provides a balance that manufacturers crave. Yet as I read more, my initial intrigue turned to concern. Transforming vast stretches of natural grasslands into tree farms came with unintended consequences. Afforestation, the opposite of deforestation, might sound like a positive initiative, but was it? In May 2023, Uruguay endured an unprecedented water crisis that left nearly half of its metropolitan population without access to drinking water for over 60 days. While the prolonged drought was the most cited reason, underlying issues of poor land management played a significant role. The crisis was a stark reminder that rapid industrial development can have far-reaching impacts. Throughout the 12-month drought that gripped the country, Country, the officials in charge failed to acknowledge, let alone assess, the impact that large-scale tree plantations and soybean monocultures had on the dwindling water levels in rivers and streams. Equally troubling is the lack of political will to evaluate and discuss the findings of scientific studies examining the effects of these plantations on the flow of rivers, streams, and aquifers. One study that was financed by the North American forestry company Weyerhaeuser determined that in watersheds with plantations, the loss of flow of the river is between 25 and 30 percent. This reluctance persists despite numerous national and international reports warning that extreme weather events will become more common due to climate change. The Santa Lucia River Basin, which provides drinking water to 60 percent of the country's population, is being increasingly forested and expansion shows no signs of slowing. Relevant authorities have been urged to halt this growth by redefining forest priority soils, which determine where tree plantations are allowed. This classification was based on outdated criteria that did not consider the impact on watersheds. The basin covers 1,347,000 hectares, with 47,362 hectares, 3.5%, currently planted mainly in the northwest headwaters, with 161,522 hectares, 12%, designated as forest priority soils. Further expansion of monocultures is expected. Additionally, plantation companies, especially Montes del Plata, are pressuring to reclassify certain soil types as forest priority, allowing plantations where they are currently banned due to potential harm. If successful, this reclassification could add 346,178 more hectares, 25% of the basin, for plantations, primarily in the watershed's headwaters. It was eye-opening to learn that these forests hadn't existed just 40 years ago. In 1987, the Uruguayan government passed a law encouraging forestry resources and forestry industries, setting the stage for a boom. Today, Uruguay boasts more more plantation forests cover than native forest, with wood pulp as its second largest export, valued at over $2 billion in 2023. Companies like Finland's UPM and Chile's Araco dominate, owning vast expanses of land and operating in tax-free zones specially created to stimulate production. At the start of the video, I typed the forest coordinates from Reddit into Google Maps, then asked it to navigate to the nearest paper mill, which turned out to be the UPM mill in Paso de los Toros. The drive from the coordinates to the mill is about an hour and a half. Behind the mill lies another forest, a sign of the significant investment UPM has made in Uruguay. The construction of this pulp mill marked the largest investment ever made by UPM and the most significant foreign investment in Uruguay's history, exceeding $3 billion. Paso de los Toros is a small town in Uruguay with a population of around 12,000. Nearby, there's a neighborhood where high-level UPM employees live, featuring long rows of identical, magazine-worthy homes that seem straight out of an architectural design spread. But you can also see the 
contrast for the people of the town. These eucalyptus trees, non-native to Uruguay but quick to grow, were harvested every 10 years, a rapid cycle in the world of forestry. To understand the unique shapes, Uruguay's forestry program explained that the pattern followed the natural topography, tracing elevation changes to create the concentric curves visible from above. These forests were essentially topographic maps drawn with trees. In April 2024, UPM announced that its first pulp transport by rail ran successfully in Uruguay when a train consisting of a locomotive and 14 wagons traveled from the Paso de los Toros pulp mill to UPM's port terminal in Montevideo. Like the forest miracle, this also came at a prize. The rail line connecting UPM's Paso de los Toros mill to its port terminal in Montevideo faced significant challenges, drawing widespread protests and raising environmental concerns. Local communities and environmental groups have voiced strong opposition, citing the potential impact on ecosystems and residential areas along the route. Noise pollution, habitat disruption, and the risk of increased industrial traffic have fueled demonstrations, with protesters demanding more thorough environmental assessments and a reconsideration of the project's route. Even with the delays and disputes over land rights, construction continued, while residents raised safety concerns regarding increased train activity through populated areas. Critics argue that the infrastructure primarily serves corporate interests, with limited benefits to local communities. This has continued to spark broader discussions about land use and priorities, pitting economic development against environmental stewardship and social well-being. UPM and government officials maintain that the project is essential for boosting the country's export capabilities and economic growth. However, environmental groups continue to monitor its impact, calling for stricter regulations and measures to minimize ecological damage. The situation remains dynamic, with ongoing negotiations and potential adjustments to address public concerns. Uruguay's story is not unique. Similar plantations exist worldwide, from Brazil to Mozambique. These artificial forests thrive in places where fertile land, low production costs, and affordable labor come together. But as governments chase economic growth and foreign investments, the hidden costs often reveal themselves slowly. In Uruguay, the tale is far from over. We might just be seeing the start of new challenges. So that's how the mystery of the fingerprint forest unraveled. Thanks for watching. Support our channel by hitting the like and subscribe button. Until next time, stay curious.